Did you guys have a good weekend? Yeah? No? I see some people that say no. It was a beautiful weekend. I don't know if... Uh, I thought it would rain the two days, but it just uh, rained half day, right? It was very nice. Uh, okay, I would like to uh, start the, the lecture today uh, talking about a little bit of motivation of why, why we're trying to understand these 3D more circles, why we're trying to understand uh, fault orientation. So what you see in this image is a fault map. So every, uh, hopefully, let me zoom in a little bit more. Uh, you can see that all of these uh, small planes, uh, probably you, you can see that they are planes, they represent a fault or most of them just a, a small fracture in the subsurface. Uh, and you can also see their color, okay? Well, we're going to see the color, uh, the reason for the color just in a little bit. Uh, but why do we want to know what is the, the stress in these fractures? Uh, we want to know that because we know that uh, fractures that are at close to shear reactivation or shear slip, they have a very high permeability, okay? So this is something very important uh, that you should remember. Fractures near shear reactivation, they have a lot of shear stress compared to the normal stress, have a high permeability. So uh, how do you think uh, oil and gas goes into well bores in unconventional formations. And anyone knows about that? Um, is it like, let me first tell you what uh, happens mostly in, con in conventional reservoirs. In conventional reservoirs, usually we have a pore network, uh, especially we're talking about the sandstone or unconsolidated sand. It's a pore network that is well connected to the wellbore. And the fluid goes through small pores, all the way through small pores to the wellbores. Do you think this is the same for unconventionals? No, wh why not, Mr. Nolasco? Uh, wh what, do what do you mean with unconventionals have a small permeability? But w w what is tight? The shale. The shale, but what is tight in the shale? The well, um, usually when we refer to unconventionals, uh, it, it's a very complex rock, and, and we need to look at it at different scales. And usually what we say is very tight is the rock matrix, the rock that doesn't have any fractures in it. But usually when you go and look at those rocks, if you look at the larger scale, you always find uh, to a, a bigger or lesser degree fractures in them. And those fractures uh, help the oil and gas to get to other bigger fractures and then to the well bore. If it weren't for those fractures, uh, probably it would be very, very difficult to produce oil and gas from unconventionals because they are just super tight. Uh, but that additional network of fractures allows uh, the fluids uh, to get into, uh, into the wellbore. And, and this is what we see right here. We, we don't see the rock matrix, but uh, we see a lot of small fractures uh, distributed in this formation. Again, uh, here the rock is made transparent. You just see the fractures, OK? And now let's see uh, the color of those fractures. You see the color goes from green, orange, and red. Well, the color means how close those fractures are to the shear envelope, to shear failure. The closer they are, here color in red, that means it's the 
more likely they are to reactivate in shear and the more likely that they have a high permeability. So knowing which fractures are, have higher permeability allows you to understand what is also the permeability of this reservoir. So for some extra points, let's say that this direction is the north, okay? North, south, uh, I always get confused with this. East, west, okay? North, south, east, west. Tell me in which direction this formation is more likely to have the highest permeability in the horizontal plane. Okay, uh, I saw many people that said that, uh, <laughs> but uh, so I cannot, <laughs> I cannot give you. Uh, well, the first one that raises his hand, but you, see, you have to tell me why, okay? Why, okay, Omar, why? East, west. Why? But why? Direction of the bank yeah. isn't that the No, no, Mr. Barrera. Are they, are they closer? Like they're more red? <laughs> they are more red because they are closer to what? <laughs> to the <laughs> criteria? They are closer to the shear failure criteria, right? That's why. So it would be much more likely in this case, uh, as most of you said, that the highest permeability is going to be in this direction. Okay? Okay, so let me ask you one more thing. According, let's say that you have the, the reservoir map, and, and now you know that these are the most conductive uh, hydraulic fractures. Uh, but um, fractures, not hydraulic fractures, just fractures. And let's say that uh, this is a tight sandstone, okay? Um, and there are enough natural fractures that you don't you're not going to do hydraulic fracture. You're just going to drill, and it's a very good rock, uh, very competent. You're just gonna drill a wellbore, and you're gonna complete it uncased. I'd like to know what is the most favor favorable direction to drill a wellbore. First one that raises hands. Okay, Mr. Nolasco. Why? Very well, because of that, right? So you will drill a wellbore in this direction because you will take advantage of all these fractures bringing all the fluids from, let's say, somewhere over here to a wellbore which is located over there. If you were to drill a wellbore, uh, let's say, somewhere in this direction, probably you will miss a lot of the conductivity of those fractures and even fluids from get from here to there, they have a much harder time to go from here to there than from here to here because of the uh, fracture permeability and isotropy. Yes, Mr. Nolasco. Why, why was it just shear, <coughs> um, shear stresses that make more permeability? Why can't, we, why can't normal stresses make more? It's a combination of both, actually. Uh, the permeability of fractures depends on normal stress and also depends on shear stress. And when you have especially brittle rocks, uh, especially like carbonates, uh, their permeability tends to be uh, higher when you have a high ratio of shear stress to normal stress. I'm, I'm gonna come back to this in a, in a minute, okay? But for example, here you have fractures, for example, with very low normal stress, but also very, high sh very low shear. Even though these one have a very low normal stress, this one over here that have a higher normal stress by higher shear will be more hydraulically conductive. And looking at this map, uh, again, for one more uh, point, extra points. Tell me, and you have to raise your hand, otherwise I do not know who, raise, who raises the hand first. Tell me what is the strike and fault of these critical stress-oriented fractures. Oh, you already uh, have your extra point, Mr. Nolasco. Yes? So the strike is uh, 90 degrees? And no. 
Oh no, wait, 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 wait. Okay, continue, continue. Yeah. Okay, strike is 90 degrees. Yes, yes, you are correct. You are right. Um, and the dip depends on the data. It looks like this is a. It looks like. It could be 90 degrees, but it depends on the data. I'm sorry, I did my my my, my question was not correct. Uh, it was missing something. So let's let's go let's go again. Okay. According to this map, what is the strike and dip of the faults which are most likely to be reactivated in shear? I'll give you a hint. The answer is here. That's stereo net. You see, you see that uh, um, we are talking about stereo nets, and they are they are used quite a bit. Yeah. And the strike. Uh, Ninety degrees. And um, so, what are you looking at? Uh, can you tell me also raise your hand almost at the same time? Yeah, uh, so I agree with some of the points. I'm looking yeah. at the points that are in the red zone there at the bottom. In the red zone, right? You see this red zone? It is the same as those colored red poles, and it's the same as, the, as this area over here. So according to this map, the most likely poles to be reactivated in shear would be an what kind of uh, stress regime would be? Uh, you raise your hand if you want to come it. Yeah, uh, but you already have basic points. Did you get one more? No, okay, Omar? I think so. Which one? No, you, you no. Uh, normal. Normal, right? Yeah. Because the dip is 60 degrees. Remember, dip 60 degrees are concise with normal. <coughs> so these are faults like this. The ones are more likely to be reactivated. And, uh, if you look at that, apparently, uh, I'm not sure about exactly what this map, where the north is, but apparently it's the north is over there. So all of these small red faults have a strike about 90 degrees, and in order to be most likely to be reactivated, they should have a dip of about 60 degrees. Notice there are some, like this orange one, that has a strike of about uh, 90 degrees, but probably the dip is not optimal to be reactivated in shear. Okay, yeah, Mr. Moyne. Uh, can you show how the strike is 90 degrees? Which way is north again? Uh, this is north. In the Serianet, always this is north. Over here. So, is, is, the, is the natural fracture oriented along the north side? Uh, in this map, the north, I'm pretty sure, is in this direction. It's pointing over there. So the, the factors are aligned in the east-west portion? East-west, yes. So, so the strike is east-west. So the strike would be 45? No, the strike is 90 degrees. It's east-west. And the dip, uh, it appears to be here at 60. So this is an example for normal faulting. And you can have exactly the same uh, for strike slip and for reverse faulting. I, I wanted to close this uh, that same, but this is also important for conventional reservoirs, especially for carbonate reservoirs that are naturally fractured, uh, knowing the orientation of uh, naturally occurring faults and fractures is, is very important. Yes, Mr. Nosk. Could you explain why the what falls with the 60 degrees in the normal fault thing get that? And that comes from over here. The plots that we were doing about the norm, normal orientation of, of faults. For normal faulting, if 
vertical stress and principal stress, faults are going to be uh, caused at an optimal angle, beta, where beta in this case is the dip, and beta is equal to 45 degrees plus a friction angle divided by 2. Friction angle is always between 30 and 40, so that makes an angle about 60 or a little bit more. That's why uh, that was supposed to be a normal faulting uh, stress regime. And this is exactly what we have done so far, but instead of doing some nice colorful plots, we're just looking at the points with the maximum shear stress to normal stress ratio. And you see the locations in this case. And in the case that I showed before, the two points were here, but that's just because the orientation of stress is 90 degrees with respect to that case, but it's very similar. Yeah. Okay, uh, we, we're going in, in, into there right now, okay? Into the 3D more circle. Uh, uh, let, let, let's me, let me just finish with this, uh, saying that this is exactly the same sample, the same uh, example. That point is the most likely to have, on the outer circles, they want to have the maximum shear to, to normal stress ratio. And let me complete this one uh, for reverse faulting. Uh, now we have here, let me see, this is going to be number one, this is going to be number two, notice that the dip is now 30 degrees, and here we're going to have a more circle where this is going to be sigma v sigma h max uh, sigma and sigma h mean the center of the circle is going to be somewhere over there and this point um, point number two are going to be located at two times beta Okay, so I'm I'm done now with this example, but uh, and we talked about some examples in class. Before I go into talking in detail about the 3D more circle, uh, I'm going to encourage you to go to to the notes and check on your own these two cases. Okay, so here you have a similar thing. Here there are two problems, 5, 1 uh, and 5, 2, that are slightly a little bit more complicated. Now, as you can see, the horizontal stresses do not align with the north-south, and they do not align uh, with north-south or east-west. So that's going to, to make the problem slightly more difficult. But it is the same principle to what we have seen uh, before, as in this case. But this one is a little bit simpler because the, one of the horizontal stresses is aligned with the north-south direction. But the procedure, procedure is exactly the same. So in order to solve the homework, you're going to have to understand how to do this, OK? If you have any troubles, just uh, let me know. We'll talk about that. But uh, I'm going to allow you to, to see that on your own. OK, so now let's talk about the Mohr circle, the 3D Mohr circle. And let's see what those points inside the circle mean. Okay. 
Uh, first of all, uh, before I go to that, let me just try a few things. Uh, I this is basically a summary of what we discussed uh, for the applications. So one uh, applications of what we're doing right now. It's important in order to know the ideal orientation of faults and. If you know the fault orientation, you may get to know what is the orientation of the principal stresses. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, let me switch. That. So, again, as a real application problem, Sometimes you can map faults and you can, based on the mapping of the faults, get to know the ideal orientation of the principal stresses or the opposite. If you know the orientation of principal stresses, you could tell what is the orientation of faults and what is the orientation of critically stressed fractures. And the second application problem is that we are always interested in knowing what is the orientation uh, for fracture reactivation uh, in shear or at the larger scale for reactivation when the shear stress over the normal stress mm -hmm. is high okay um, so what we're going to do now is based on this second application also to calculate exactly what is the value of tau and sigma n based on some in situ stresses and we're going to do that through two methods one method i'm going to explain uh explain it here and the other method i'm just going to go through it very quickly uh, but i'll leave it up to you if you want to learn that or not uh, it just involves a lot of math that uh, if you want to know that you can do it but um, I'm more interested in that you remember the concepts of about what's going on. So with that, we start with the 3D Mohr circle. So let's see what is a 3D Mohr circle. Um, we're going to start by always drawing a coordinate system. In this coordinate system we're going to have a block of rock which it is subjected to in situ stresses and from that block uh, we're going to consider that inside this block there is a fracture at an arbitrary orientation what we want to do is to calculate on this fracture what is the acting normal stress and the acting shear stress well remember the normal stress will be the stress perpendicular to the plane and the shear stress will be the stress parallel to the plane okay uh, I need a little bit of space so let me move this over here okay so how do we do that we're gonna do it with the Mohr circle 
basically always in the Mohr circle we always draw normal stress in the x-axis shear stress in the x-axis and since this is a 3D Mohr circle it, it means that it's taking the state of stress in three dimensions and because in three dimensions I have three principal stresses there are going to be three important points in this 3D Mohr circle but before we do that let's start with two points okay uh, let's say that uh, in this case this is normal faulting this is just an example okay it could be it could be different it could be strike slip it could be reverse faulting it could be any anything and if that's the case I'm going to draw here that this is sigma h mean and this is sigma v both principal stresses the circle in between these two is going to be this one and let me move the stick mark a little bit and with that circle I'm going to be able to calculate stresses if you remember that are always a combination of the plane of sigma v and the plane of sigma h mean so what what does that mean well let me do another drawing over here the same block that I draw I drew in the above this is exactly the same but now I'm, I'm just going to concentrate on sigma v and sigma h mean pointing at this point over here with my pencil uh, oh let me do it with with this pen this point over here can you tell me which plane is that the top the 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 one facing us or the one facing to the side the top right that's the top plane and this plane which which plane is it is this plane right over here and any point in this circle it's just going to be a plane that goes from the plane of sigma 1 to the plane of sigma h1 with an angle beta 1 so for example in this case if beta 1 let's say is equal to 40 uh, that means that that's going to be 2 beta 1 is going to be a point somewhere over there this is going to be To beta 1 and any point in the circle is going to be just a plane which is a combination of these two uh, and you can think that I'm telling you like as a hinge there right that's a hinge that's going to be a plane that goes from here to there okay so far it's okay all right so now let's go and talk about sigma h max let's say the sigma h max is somewhere over here and um, okay so i'm going to draw again the the cube this is exactly what i i had before this is sigma b and between sigma v and sigma h max there is going to be another plane another circle which is going to be this one which i'm drawing here in green probably you cannot see very well but it's in green and 
that circle is going to represent the normal and shear stresses on all the planes that are a result of a combination going from sigma b to sigma h max. So let's say, for example, that I'm looking at the plane somewhere over here. And well, this is going to be the angle beta 2. And let's say beta 2 is equal to 60. And if I want to see where that is in the Mohr circle, that is going to be 60 times 2, about 120. That's going to be somewhere a point over here. This circle, uh, I forgot to do this. So this is center number 1. The second circle has center number 2. And this angle over here is 2 beta 2. But if I want to know the, n the shear stress and normal stress in any plane, it's just a combination of the plane of sigma v and sigma h max. Notice that here I'm also uh, uh, shading the, the plane. And that means that from which plane I start to measure be beta 1 and beta 2. Notice that always in here we start from the maximum stress towards the lowest stress, either sigma h min or sigma h max, right? And always al also counterclockwise. All right, so green circle, that means shear stress and normal stress on all of these planes. Let's go to the last one. Uh, the last one is going to be a combination between sigma h min and sigma h max. And this is going to be a circle that has a top more or less over here. It's going to have a center somewhere over here. And And now is where I need your input. Tell me where would you start measuring the angle beta 3? In which plane? In the plane of sigma h max, right? Towards the plane of sigma h min. And that's going to be a plane. Um, let's see. Let me do, for example, let's do a small one. This is beta 3. And, well, I just let me, let me leave it like there. And let's say beta 3 is 20, 20 times 2, 40. S it's a point somewhere over there and this one is beta 3 so if I want to know the shear normal stress in any plane that it's a vertical plane and it's a combination of sigma h max and sigma h min it's going to be that circle okay yes The, the uh, this one bigger than that one? Uh -huh. I just assumed that. I just assumed that sigma h max was closer to sigma b, but there was no reason uh, to to do it uh, a, a different size. Could could be any size. Depends on the in situ stresses. Okay. So okay, something very important now is that that you remember that the lines of the more circles they represent all planes which are aligned with one of the principal stresses. Notice that, for example, this plane over here uh, is aligned with sigma h max. This plane over here is aligned with sigma h min. And this plane over here, which is vertical, is aligned with vertical sigma v. So 
all of those planes are aligned at least with one of the principal stresses. What about you had something like this, which is not aligned with any of the principal stresses? What would be their uh, shear and normal stress? Where would that plot in here? What do you think? Why? Well, we know very clearly that. Exactly. Correct. So let's see why why it wouldn't be bigger outside this circle, because if if it were somewhere outside this circle say a point over here, it would need a principal stress which is higher than what I already have. Or it can be a point anywhere in here because if I had a state of a stress like this, that means that this is a principal stress because it doesn't have any shear stress. But I already have three principal stresses. So it cannot be here, it cannot be there, it cannot be anywhere outside. All ob oblique planes are points inside the 3D, the three more circles. So all of these are oblique planes which are not aligned with any of the principal stresses. And that's exactly what we were seeing uh, in here. So here you see the mapping of all real faults that just a few of them are on the circles. Uh, here you have a few, right? But not that many over here, not that many over there. Most of them, they plot inside. Yes? On the steering net, why don't we have any points in the northern red area? Here? Yes. Uh, because what this is telling you is that these faults should be dipping towards the south right but apparently the actual faults are not dipping towards the south but they are dipping towards the north that that does that make sense uh, in the stereo net we can see the dip of the of the faults in the more circle we can't the more circle we just see shear stress and normal stress so all these faults over here are some of those over there but none of those are dipping towards the south. They are all dipping towards the north. That's why we have an stereo net here because it also helps us to see the direction in which they are dipping. Okay, so that's exactly what I want you to remember. Uh, what is a 3D more circle? what the circles represent, and what are the points inside. And also to remember that the closer you get to a shear failure, if there is any shear failure line, the higher is going to be the shear stress to normal stress uh, ratio. Yes? Can you explain why you can have them inside one of those two units? Here? So you cannot have them here because let's say for example that I have a point over here. If there is a point over here, that means that I have some normal stress, but I have zero shear stress. But that's only possible when this is a principal stress. But I already have three principal stresses. I, I cannot have four principal stresses. So that's why you cannot have any point in there. Well, in, inside would be the same because that will force you to have some principal stress which is smaller than this or uh, different than that value. We could I imagine that I move this point over here and the circles move with it. If I do that, I can vary what is the shear stress and normal stress. Uh, say I can move all the way this one to here and in that case, you will have possible points in here. 
but at this current condition I cannot have anything below the circle all the possible combinations are here yes Okay. Um, so remember we're writing these uh, shear planes, right? That's where the shear fractures, is that correct? Like where they, they fracture along the line? This plane? Well, I know you have your tectonic stresses, right? Yeah. And that's what we've been going over. We have like the crosses, right? Correct. And that would be the shear failure. Is that, is that? Okay, so what we were doing before uh, it's and, th and this is very important you remember would be the ideal orientation of faults or the also you could think of this at, as the point of maximum shear stress to normal stress it, we were just looking at one or condition that gives you two solutions two planes but the, all of these would be just points somewhere over here. Now this is a general case. It's a general case in which we have all possible orientations and we have also planes which are not aligned with the principal stresses. Uh, this example allows us to see, uh, coming back to this example over here, where that red zone is going to be. But in the field, in reality, you're going to have fractures in all orientations. And for that, we need to understand uh, this general. general. Yes. OK, so we were able to be build this circle and get to know what is the uh, orientation of those planes but remember that at any point over over here eventually what we want to calculate is a normal stress and a shear stress with a more circle method you're going to be able and you're going to have to do that in homework to calculate normal and shear stress on the more circle for all these oblique planes, you can also do it with a more circle, but it is a real pain to do that graphically. So we're not going to do that, okay? We're not going to insist that. People uh, in 1800s, they used to do that because they didn't have computers as we do today. Uh, so we're not going to do that, but I want you to know what these angles means because they have a physical meaning so um, I have an example that I like that you work on uh, so you get to calculate normal stress and shear stress using the 3D Mohr circle so let's work on this for five minutes and let's see if you get a solution for all these kind of problems, I'm going to give you what is the state of stress and what is the orientation of the fault. So in this case, I have an SV of 23 MPA, SH max of 20 MPA, SH mean. 13.8 MPA and also I'm going to give you additional information that the minimum principal stress it's oriented at 90 degrees from the north that's what azimuth means azimuth is the angle is will be the strike for a fault uh, for this direction would be SH mean is pointing uh, 90 degrees from the north, okay? And the fault that I'm interested in, I want you to compute the stress in here, has this strike and a dip, say, 60 degrees towards the east. I like that you calculate 
sigma n tau and tau divided sigma n. I'm going to give you the steps that you should follow, okay? But I'm not going to solve it for you. But first one, what you should do is you should identify the stress regime. Hopefully, you already know that by now. Two, if possible, well, it's going to be always possible, but if, if possible, draw a block diagram. If one of the stresses is not aligned north, south, east, west, it's a little bit more complicated. So you may rather go for the top view and third, go ahead and identify the fault. And corresponding circle and angle in the more circle if you follow those steps you'll see that it's not too difficult to solve this problem okay so i'll let you work on that i'll drink a little bit of water and i'll walk around Okay, guys, uh, we'll see the solution on on, uh, on Wednesday. Goodbye, everyone.